You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Kenneth Bomo. On today's show, we'll attempt to understand the strides made in gender diversity in the African workplace. You can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets and follow my handle at Kenneth Bomo. Recently recognized by the Financial Times as one of the top 100 global female executives this year, my guest, an entrepreneur, filmmaker, investor, and public speaker, Biola Labi, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Partner of Biola Labi Media, joins me on Beyond Markets today as we discuss the strides made in gender diversity in the African workplace. Thank you for your time, Biola. Thank you for having me. It's good to be back. I would really like to know, first of all, what's the first thing that came to your mind when you heard you were shortlisted amongst this group? I have to say I was really surprised because it wasn't a, it wasn't a Nigerian list. It wasn't a African list. It was a, it was a, it was a UK list. And so I was, it's, it's a global list looking at women that are supporting women in the workplace globally. And so I was, I was very, when I first got the email, to be honest with you, I didn't really believe it. I was like, is this real financial times or something? Because they were asking for more information. And so I sent them some information. They asked for my CV and everything. And of course, it's embargoed. You can't talk about it. And so I sent them that information. And then they sent me another email asking me a couple of more questions. And so I was really, you know, I, I was skeptical at you first. Think was a scam I didn't really <laughs> I, I didn't really believe it at first because I was like well how would they know about me I mean I'm an African based um, female executive I've been working across the continent yes I do speeches and speaking all, all over the world but my work is really on I mean on the continent and also in the US so it was a UK organization so if it was a US organization I probably wouldn't have been as surprised but then I looked and clicked on all the links and they did go back to FT so I was like okay let me send my information so I sent the information once again like the time in between when they tell you you've been nominated and they ask you for your CV and they get back to you it's such a it's so many months in between that you forget about these things. And then they did send me an email that I am I made the list and that based on my work with supporting women in the workplace and championing women around the world, um, I'm one of the women, uh, 100 women. So what does this, being part of this elite group, what does this mean for you personally? I think for me personally, what it really means is um, that people it really means more about being nominated because I, I'm, for me, I'm curious, like, I want to ask like, who nominated me. I want to ask them that, but they don't tell you that. And so the fact is that, I mean, it's, it's humbling that when you do your work, you make, an, you make an impact in people's lives. So obviously I had a positive impact in someone's life or some people's lives for them to make that, um, for them to make that nomination. So that really is what's important to me is the fact that I really work hard to make sure that I'm uplift, I'm lifting women up, I'm contributing to the success of women, and I am being a, I am being a voice for women. And so when you get this type of recognition, it means that obviously if it's only one person, you impacted that person enough for them to go on this website and nominate you. And so that's really what was um, what was heartwarming for me was like, wow, you do work. You don't really know if people are seeing your work. But when you see these things, it means it's it's aff affirmation and vindication that you should continue to do what you're doing. So looking at this list, you know, I would personally really like to see more African women mm -hmm. on this list. Mm -hmm. What do you think is holding back the African women from being being at this level? Globally? Well, uh, number one, I, I, I do a lot of work um, on, on either um, working groups in different parts of the world. And so I think sometimes people probably don't know they can nominate women to be on this list. So I think that's number one, is that we need to nominate more women to be on these lists. We need to nominate more women when we see anything that women can be part of. Um, I, was a, I, I went to Yale for a fellowship. It was because I was nominated. I was nominated by another woman who called me to say, I'm gonna nominate you. And I do the same thing for people all the time. I always call people saying, I'm gonna nominate you for things. So I think those are really one of the biggest things that, you know, first of all, you have to, you have to be in the game to even be recognized. So that's number one. And now that we know this, we can nominate more women. Um, the second thing is to just be part of different networks globally. I mean, just being, I mean, it's great to do stuff locally, but really taking that knowledge that, of what you're doing also globally. So try to find opportunities to network globally. And you can do all this stuff literally online now. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be out of your okay. network to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. So I'd like you to speak to very interesting things you're saying, you know, nominating people, getting them on there. For me, it speaks to the role of mentorship. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like you to speak to, you know, 
when it comes to women to women mentorship mm -hmm. as, and what's what makes it so different from 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 the other sexes mm. well as a as a as a woman um early in my career i got really good advice which said that i should have male and female mentors and i really made sure that i had men and female mentors because women can help you do and communicate in so many different ways and help you navigate a lot of the treacherous waters in corporate in the corporate world i always say you know Corporate is corporate, corporate America, corporate Africa, they all have different, tre 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 there's different things you not need to navigate. And so that's one thing. But then male, um, male mentors also help you understand, especially in a corporate environment, maybe sometimes you're not asking the right questions or maybe the language you need, need to use. And I think one of the things that some of my male mentors ta taught me was really not to be so sensitive. And so I think that really just sort of, you know, shedding off that, you know, that um, taking things personally was really one of the most important things I learned from some of my male mentors. And so I've always had a really nice balance. And I think it's so important for more women to mentor women. I, I have amazing relationships with my bosses from America, my boss in South Africa, and now that I have my own company, I still call on some of these female mentors that I've had for many years. When you look at gender diversity on, on the continent, you know, would you say, or I'd like you to do more like a comparison when you look at how things have been in the past 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe 20, mm -hmm. you know, and how things are right now. Mm -hmm. Would you say we've made some strides? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, we've definitely made some strides. And there's some real numbers to support that, those strides. I mean, there, there was a McKinsey Woman report that was published um, last year, and I think there's a lot of numbers in there that does support that we've made some strides. At strides. Um, I think the other thing, too, that I'll like, I mean, I'll probably like to say 10 years, because I've been working on the continent for 10 years, and that's a really comfortable, um, area for me to to sort of range for me to talk about. I think in the 10 years we've seen the role of women in, in the workplace increase. There are more women in the workplace. Some of that is because of the economic need, but some of that is just because more women are being educated and more women, I mean, we just need more women and more people in the workplace. So that's number one. I do think that there are a lot of, there are a lot of, I mean, the ratio of men and women in the workplace isn't that different. I think what really where the difference starts to come in is elevating women to leadership positions. So when you look at how many promotions women get, and when they get in those roles, how they handle those roles. A lot of times people can be overwhelmed in leadership roles and I feel like men get more assistance and more passes than women and I think that's really what well, that was really one of the things I really wanted to work on when I became um, when I was a managing director and some of my roles was making sure that we really worked with women and men to help them navigate and elevate beyond being managers into being leaders. When you look at the challenges facing the you know, the African female C-suite executive, what would you say are the top three challenges they face in, you know, in leadership? I mean, I think one of, I mean, one of the things about the FT list is basically um, women on that list are people that are working either one, two or three positions away from the CEO. So you're, you're really, really sort of in that executive cohort um, at a company, and those are the women that are recognized on the list. And also one of the, I mean, the things about the women recognized on the list, you can tell based just reading from their bios, some of the challenges and actually some of the things they've done. And they're really amazing women on there. Some of them are, uh, are role models as well. But when you look at these challenges that women face in the C-suite, I think some of it are the same that men face, but obviously because women's role in research has shown us is that women also still do a majority share of the housework, of homework. Not necessarily that they're cleaning and, and, um, and cooking, but they're the ones that are in charge of sort of making sure that that, that does happen. They're, ma they're making sure that they're, they're also primary caregivers for the children. And so there's a lot of times where, I mean, women, especially executive women, always joke that they need a wife as well. You know, it's like, they're like, my husband has a wife, I need a wife. And I think that we, we as women, we have different type of wives. We have nannies, we have cooks and all these things that help us. And and assist us and also your executive assistants become a big part of your success and so I think building those teams are sometimes something that women need to do and also give themselves permission to do a lot of times women also have this feeling that uh, and, and I mean I think and even in recent years we've had to change the conversation for women of saying you don't have to do everything you can empower other people to do things and I think those are some of the conversations that we're having now that we weren't having before and I have to be honest with you when I started my career a lot of women weren't saying how hard it was a lot of women were just saying oh you know I'm, oh everything is great and now women are saying actually no this is a lot of work and I think having those honest conversations are really important for women I think also a big thing is the way women 
the women form relationship and build relationship is very different from the way men build relationship. And sometimes that could also be a, a way of propelling us when we're in the C-suite. And sometimes it could take longer for us to get there because it just takes, I mean, we just, our way of cultivating relationships are different. So, but when you look at the, the workspace in Africa, the, when you, the peculiarities in the mm -hmm. workspace in Africa, would you say it's part of it is holding women back, basically? I do feel like there are some of the some roles and some positions in the African workplace that are not very from friendly to the female to f women and also women that are working. Um, for example, politics is one of those places. There's some there's there's for some reason um, in politics the the need to have an inordinate amount of meetings and a lot of these meetings happen at really late hours and it's really hard for women sometimes to sort of put their kids to bed and then go out for meetings and then come back. There's just a lot of, um, I mean, there's a lot of issues that go along with that and sometimes simply could be security in which why you're not participating in this. I think in the workplace there's been a lot of sort of um, compromise and also creating more friendlier workplaces. I mean, there are quite a number. I mean, in the last 10 years, there are some companies I've visited that now have crutches, which you'd never saw that before. Even 10 years ago, you did not see that in the workplace. So those type of things. The things also about, I mean, also I think the techno technology has also helped us in a way that we can take care of some businesses online without having to do them face to face. So I really think that in the in multinationals or even in um, some of our own local companies, there's been a lot more infrastructure built in to support women. When you look at compensation, remuneration, you know, the whole talk about equal pay and, and all that coming in there. Would you say, well, we all know that that gap, that gap exists, still mm -hmm. exists, mm -hmm. but would you say we're closing in on that gap right now? I don't believe we're closing in on that gap. I think that is one conversation that we need to continue to have on the continent. And I think the reason why we're not closing in on that gap is because we're not actually having the conversation. There's a global conversation going on. But when I look at local, I mean, when I look at Nigeria, we're not having that conversation. When I look at some of the other countries across the continent, we're not having that conversation. But one of the things women need to do is also have an open conversation about money. One of the things we find is that it is, it, there is a cultural barrier, global Globally, that talking about money is vulgar and so women don't tend to talk about money as much as they do. They talk about other people's money so you manage your company's money very well but when it comes to managing and talking about your money you don't really have those conversations. I think in those spaces we're really doing well and having those conversations. I remember I had a I, had a, I, I gave a speech at um, Wimbiz in which I was talking about negotiation, how to negotiate for yourself. And really part of that negotiation means you have to understand what other people in your field are making, which means to understand that sometimes you have to ask people. And so part of building relationships and building those type of relationships along your career is that you can pick up the phone to be and ask people, look, you've done this similar job or you've hired people that have done the similar job or you d you know you know people doing the similar job. Can you help me find out what type but you, of But you know salaries are very sensitive. Many people don't like to discuss their salaries. Some for some organizations they actually put a lip service on that one. Yeah, but you can find people outside of those uh, outside of your organization and find other people that can have those conversations. People have to understand how much people are making for them to be able to negotiate because for sometimes even within an organization you can see people of the same sex doing the same job but they're not necessarily earning, earning the same pay. You know, so it's now it's now getting a bit harder to 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 gauge it is getting harder to gauge, but I think that it is important to understand what ballpark you're in. And the last thing you want to do is find out that someone you're both in the you're both doing the same job and you're not even in the same ballpark of salaries. And um, as someone that happened to me very early on in my career, and I made it a point for it not to happen again. So I do ask questions, and I do try to make sure that even even in even for people that don't work, I mean, so a lot of times it's not easy to ask people within your convers your organization, but it is important to find out what the ballpark of the same of that job is. And then you can do that very easily at the same time. Sometimes you can do that research, but you can also call the right people to get that information. Okay, so we'll take a quick break right now, Biola. So I've been speaking to Biola Labi, the CEO and managing partner of Biola Labi Media. Welcome back to Beyond Markets. If you're just joining us, Biola Labi, CEO and managing partner of Biola Labi Media, is with me today, and we're discussing the strides made in gender diversity in the African workplace. Now we're moving on to movies this time around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've seen some of your work and I would say I'm quite impressed. Uh, I saw Lara on the Beats and then uh, I would like you to speak to the inspiration that, you know, what got you into this journey or into film or filmmaking? 
Um, well, once I left my, my job and I was doing a lot of consulting as part of our as part of what we do, we were consulting people on production, we were consulting people on even just starting companies um, and media companies, especially in the entertainment space. And we were doing and we still do that. We do a lot of consulting. That's really part I mean a big part of our work. But then also too, we had always wanted to tell certain stories and so um, one of the things that was important to us was just to do something that just kept us also in the business of producing so that we can advise people in a, in a way that made sense. And I think as someone that had always worked in entertainment, there were some things I wanted to see on television that I wasn't seeing. And one of them was about Nigerian food and travel. And so I really, I felt like that was a space that um, we weren't exploring. We were doing food competitions, but we weren't actually engaging people that cook every day, people on the street, what that meant, um, street food, restaurants, local restaurants, upmarket restaurants. And so we created a show called Bukas and Joints that travels around Nigeria, but also has done a stint outside of the country. It went to London. We're also looking at going to Kenya. We've been invited to come to Kenya. And it's a, it's a, it's a show that's not pretentious. It's a, just a fun show that goes around and um, profiles authentic Nigerian food. From where you sit, I'd like to speak to the potential you see in the quality of in the, in the diversity of content that could come out from this region? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for me, the, the, the diversity of content is, on, it, I mean, there's no limit to the type of stories we need to be telling and we can tell. I think for us, the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge is around commercialization. So how do we commercialize our content beyond our shores? How do we make sure that we're able to engage the right partners, even locally? And a lot of that has to do with our infrastructure and the way our businesses are set up. But on the other hand, a big part of that is the advertising opportunity in, in Nigeria and in Africa in general. I mean, if you look at Africa as a whole, it doesn't have the same advertising command dollars as other regions of the world, like India with its population or even the U.S. And so I think that one of the things that we need to continue to do is as our middle, as our markets emer uh, grow, so when you as you have people become much more consumers, I think that there are going to be much more opportunities for even storytelling, from high drama to low drama, from rom-coms to different genres and even in the reality show segment and reality show segments is also a lot of infotainment I mean that's a lot of what you, I mean some of the work that you guys will be doing as well which is around building businesses how you build businesses those type of stories and bringing those stories to yeah, life it's very interesting because I was actually going to get get that for my next point because I'm looking at the beyond the creative skill set mm -hmm. that is needed to put Nollywood on the map and all that. When you look at the other ancillary skills, ancillary skills that are needed to to run a business company, a, a profitable media business, you know, do you think we're lacking in, on this front? And what do you think can be done to also improve the, that part of the industry? I mean, I think that there are a lot of amazing business owners in Nigeria that own media companies, that own independent production companies. And a lot of people have been in this business for a long time. So I always say, you know, they're making money doing something and they're selling their content, they're creating content, they're selling stories. So I do believe that there are, um, there are a lot of really good business men and women in this business. I think the biggest part of the upper, the biggest part of what hasn't come together is really from uh, from distribution and getting payments. And so that what I mean by that is that people paying more for content. So that is either from an advertiser's perspective or from a streaming perspective. When you look at those opportunities and those channels, they have not been well developed. And a lot of that is the future of that is going to be based on broadband. The more broadband consumption we have, the more we're going to be able to consume and buy more content. Yeah, because we're part of a global market space. We already see what we do with Netflix, what we do with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Amazon Prime mm -hmm. and the rest of them. So I think... Uh, and there's already some progress made in Netflix. There's a number of Nigerian films already on Netflix. Netflix has just done its first original, uh, original film um, licensing. Of, um, of a deal here in Nigeria with Genevieve Nanji's um, Lionheart. So there is a lot of conversations happening and I think those are the opportunities we need. Because we're part of a global community, our, our, our stories and our films also need to transcend to be a global, to be part of the global universe. But I think that at the end of the day, the biggest market for us is still here in Nigeria and on the African continent. Going back to your journey into filmmaking, I'd like you to just speak to, you know, you know, your expectation when you were about to settle into the industry and then the reality you met on ground. Mm. What was the big difference there and what was the reality check for you? So when I started, when we started this journey um, from entrepreneurship perspective, we really started um, with 
just a couple of things we wanted to do. First, we wanted to be specific about being in television. Um, I have a very strong television background. I understand television, and so I wanted to be in television. I really wasn't that interested in film because film is a very different beast from television. Um, that's number one. Number two, a big, uh, the second part of our business was going to be consulting, which is a big part of what we do. Um, film was really something that came because people were engaging me, people wanted to do co-productions, and so our first film is actually a co-production, and from that, we, we, that's where we first got the bug. And then we said, okay, you know what, there's a couple of other stories we want to tell, um, let's create another world, um, let's create another film, and that's how we did our second film. Our second film is really, um, it's really work, it was, came about because we were working with some people that we felt like it was important for us to start talking about financial literacy. We wanted to talk about financial responsibility. We wanted to talk about wealth transfer. These are very thing, uh, big things that fascinate me in the Nigerian culture and how and how it doesn't happen as much as it happens in other cultures, especially wealth transfer from one generation to another. And this is an African-wide challenge. And so when we started to put the elements of that story together, which is Lara and the Bead, um, it was really going to be about two sisters because we wanted to use these two women to tell stories about some of the challenges women face on the continent, dealing with their own money, but also in life in general. And so that's why we have two strong sisters, um, once again, very strong female her um, heroes in the film. And we want to make sure that we are able to create another world for them outside of the film. So we're engaging in, in writing books about sort of their life as younger, as when they're younger, and we want to use that to push issues around STEM, issues around financial literacy. We really believe in creating amazing, strong characters that can live on television. So once again, I'm coming back to my television roots and coming back to creating other products from a main hero product, which is the film, and now we're working on a television series and a book series. When you look at the structure of the market, I want to speak specifically on the cinema mm -hmm. angle of things now. Well, would you say that the filmmakers are getting the best deal from the whole structure as it is right now? I don't know if it's fair to say they're getting the, uh, the best deal or not the best deal. I think that in, I think Nigerians in general are not getting the best deal from the opportunity that cinema has. And that is because we have such, we don't have a number, we have very few cinemas in Nigeria. Um, and I think at any given time, we have possibly between 30 and 33 cinemas operating and working in Nigeria. What that means is that with 36 states, that means that there are some states that there is no cinema. So then for a filmmaker to even make any, um, to say that a filmmaker is getting the best is, is not really, it's, it's, it's a false equivalency because we don't even have enough cinemas to have that conversation. I mean, I think what cinemas do, which is contribute to a profile and elevating the, 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 the film and therefore you can then do other things with the film from a distribution perspective. But with everything you're always going to have a couple of unicorns and I think we've seen one unicorn with the wedding party. But I think that when you look at a, when you look at the full industry, there is very, I mean the opportunities in cinema is still limited until there are more, there are more investments in actual cinemas and that, that's a big part of that. I'd like to go into your work in leadership development. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard you, ha you have the Grooming for Greatness. Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like you to speak to that and, you know, the kind of work, what you're trying to achieve with that. Mm -hmm. So Grooming for Greatness, um, when I was hiring um, people, at a, I was hiring a lot of people when I was in, um, when I was in, in, in sort of TV broadcasting and training people. And what that meant is you needed to elevate people very quickly into different leadership positions because you need to empower people very quickly to make sure that they are able to lead. One of the things we kept on finding was people were, people were very good when it was just a functional role and they just sort of had to do their job and deliver and go home. But the minute you sort of needed people to do more as a leader, be more strategic, it wasn't that they didn't have the skills, it was almost that they were lacking the direction and the confidence to do that. And so I just really kept on struggling and battling like how do we do this? How do we work how do we work on this? And so we I mean while I was in the company, we did a lot of work around empowering people um, development programs, really working with HR to do that. But when I left, I thought that if I had this problem, other people must have surely had this problem. And so we started Grooming for Greatness, where it's really about taking people that are really doing interesting things and really trying to amplify and elevate them so that they can become more influential. So some of it includes really helping people understand their strengths. So we do 
We do a personality test with them. We, they have a leadership coach that comes and works with them. We also bring in amazing people with amazing networks to come and be part of their mentor mentorship sort of coalition. But also what we try to do is also build a peer network and so that each cohort becomes a peer network. And I think that's really been working out. And you see them really supporting and elevating and promoting each other. So in a way, you almost have another group of people that are encouraging you and cheering you on. And once again, these are things that kept on that have been really influential in my career is having different networks, sometimes even out of the country. And so you're able to engage people and talk about your challenges in a way that people are able to support you. And it really, I mean, it's not something that people in your immediate environment would know. And so having those peer groups have been really helpful in my career. And I wanted to give that opportunity to other people. So giving back to the society in the way you can. Exactly. Thank you for your time, Biola. It's been a wonderful conversation so far. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah. That was Biola Labi, CEO and managing partner of Biola Labi Media. And that's it on Beyond Markets for today. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can watch all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website at cnbcafrica.com and stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets. And follow me at Kenneth Ibomo. Do have a great day.